Okay, everyone, we're going to get started because we have so much to talk about today. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Judy Browse, and I'm the Executive Director of the North American Association for Environmental Education. I'm so happy you could be here. We really are excited by how many people are interested in the results of this national survey. And it's very excited to exciting to see you all here to hear about the launch of this report because this data really helps us all learn more about the field and what's happening across the country. And really wanna say thank you to all of you who sent in questions. We had so many great questions and if we answered them all, we'd be here for a couple of weeks. We will do our best. And if we don't get to them, we will follow up on EE Pro. But thank you again for sending those in. And we know that early childhood is a critical time in a child's life and that there are so many benefits of spending time in nature and environmental education opportunities for our youngest learners. And when you think about the research, it's just pouring in about all the benefits and the value of spending time in nature and connecting kids to nature and the benefits these have for so, you know, the lifetime of a child. And Christy and Emily will talk more about the research and the impact of spending time, but it's really exciting to see the research that supports all the work that so many on this webinar are doing. And we were really excited to launch this report because there has been a huge growth in nature-based preschools, and it's an indication that people are realizing just how important it is to help our kids get a good start and to spend time in nature and especially to spend time in nature with educators. And so today you're gonna to get a chance to hear about the results of that. It's not just the growth, but also how did COVID impact um, early childhood, equity issues, and so much more. And we do have two amazing speakers who are part of the NAAE team, Christy and Emily, and I'll introduce them more fully in a minute, but we're really lucky to have them here. And as many of you know, who have been on our webinars before, what we are trying to do is bring new ideas, research, insights that will help all of us do a better job at what we're doing, learn more, share more. And we really appreciate the suggestions that you all send in for future topics and speakers. So keep them coming. And a big thank you to our partners at the Forest Service. They have been partners with us for so many years, and we love this. Uh, partnership on EE Inspire webinars, which is all about sparking innovation and in environmental education for the NAAE network, the Forest Service network, and anybody who wants to join. And a special thank you to Rachel Baer, who is our partner in crime on all of this, She's an environmental education specialist at the Forest Service. And there she is pictured with her two best friends. So Rachel, thank you so much. And thanks also to our affiliate co-host, for supporting the webinar series as well. And if you don't know who your affiliate is or haven't been involved, please get involved or contact us because this is a way to get engaged in environmental education at the state, regional and provincial level. And a big thank you to EPA as well as E360 for their support of the webinars that we do um, every month. And again, we are using Zoom. You can talk to us through the chat. We'll be recording this. You'll get a copy of the recording, a copy of the chat. And again, if we don't get to your questions, we'll try and answer some more in EE Pro. But really wonderful, thought-provoking questions have come in because there's a lot of interest in this topic. We are also doing live captioning in case you need help um, and just click on the captioning button. And I want to thank Anne for all of her work in the actually managing the webinar series. Anne is our Director of Professional Development. She's the manager of EE360 Plus and just an amazing colleague. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers today who are part of the NAAAE team and welcome Christy and Emily. And let me just tell you two minutes about Christy. She's the Director of the Natural Start Alliance she actually helped launch the Natural Start in 2013, and she is an amazing leader, thinker, editor, writer, presenter, and we couldn't have a better person at the helm, and she's been working in environmental education for more than 25 years, and you can ask her later about her connection to Robert Redford, 
So Christy, welcome. And then Emily, who is an amazing member of the Natural Start Alliance team, and she is a conference and communication specialist. And Emily does so much to advance the work of the Natural Start Alliance, including supporting the conference, all our communication and outreach and everything related to the work that we do. So Emily, thank you. And I am now going to turn it over to this dynamic duo, starting with Christy. Welcome, you two. Thank you so much, Judy, for that super warm welcome. And um, <clears throat> thank you, Rachel and the Forest Service for um, your support of this webinar series and really all that you do to support environmental education in the US. And um, I think that you'll find that there's some really interesting uh, findings in the report related to uh, nature-based early childhood education and public lands. So, um, so we're really excited to share the results of our national survey with you. Um, of course, we're not going to have enough time during this webinar to tell you about everything that we found, but um, we encourage you to um, take a look at the report to see all of the findings, but we will share some highlights. And um, we also wanted to make sure that we um, save time to provide examples of real programs so you can see how some of these trends look on the ground. So as Judy mentioned, uh, Natural Start is a project of NAAAE. NAAAE supports all forms of environmental education and Natural Start provides focus for that work in the early childhood years. And every kind of early childhood environmental education is valuable. There are a wide variety of strategies that educators can use to help children develop environmental literacy. And when we say environmental literacy, we mean helping young children develop skills, knowledge, and dispositions that will help them be engaged in their communities and feel confident that they can help um, uh, take care of nature and environment and also each other. So environmental education for young children can happen in a variety of settings. It can be non-formal, informal settings like schools, and it can also happen at home with um, caregivers and parents as educators. But there's now so much data, Judy referenced this too, that demonstrates that nature really enhances early childhood education. We know that nature has sort of dual benefits for learning. It's both a positive setting for learning because it offers calm and quiet settings, it promotes cooperation and lots of opportunities for creative play. And nature also has positive effects on learners. So children tend to be more attentive, more self-disciplined and more engaged and interested when they're learning in more natural settings. And we also know that nature promotes children's health. Um, it encourages physical activity and it promotes positive mental health. So there are a lot of reasons to bring nature into early childhood education. And nature preschools really maximize the benefits of nature for education. And they also help children develop environmental literacy. So nature preschools are something that we closely track and support at Natural Start. And I just wanted to um, make a quick note about how we track nature preschools. Our wonderful, talented colleague, Betty Olivolo, uh, manages this effort and um, keeps a database of programs in the United States. We do the best that we can to count every nature preschool in the country. And of course, we have probably missed some along the way, but we're confident that we have a pretty accurate count because we use a variety of strategies to keep track. And I just also wanted to note that the schools that make up our count are not necessarily members. This isn't a, a count of Natural Start membership. It's a count of actual programs. And um, to decide if we think we should count a nature a, a program as a nature preschool, our staff make a quick decision based on publicly available information. So they're checking to make sure that first we consider it a school as opposed to an informal program like child and caregiver classes which are really common and wonderful. Um, and then we also wanna confirm that it's a nature-based program. And I think it's also worth just clarifying that if we count a program as a nature preschool, it's not some sort of an endorsement or an accreditation. That's not something that we offer a natural start right now. And likewise, if we don't count a program as a nature preschool, that has nothing to do with the program's quality whatsoever. It's just um, a tool that we use to track the growth of these programs and to be able to communicate with them for informational purposes. So what do we mean 
when we say a nature preschool? Well, these are schools where educators are working toward the traditional and very important goals for supporting children's development, like you would see in any school. And they're also focusing on building children's environmental literacy. So in these programs, nature is central in the curriculum, which is why it's called nature-based. They tend to use a child-led play-based approach with lots of time for children to play and learn outside. And uh, many programs believe that it's important for um, children to take appropriate risks as they play. They allow for um, activities like um, climbing trees or playing with sticks. Um, and you wouldn't see those kinds of activities typically in schools that aren't nature-based. So that's um, about as far as we'll go during this webinar on sort of the philosophy and practice of nature-based preschools. But if that's something that you want to learn more about, I really recommend the Nature-Based Preschool Professional Practice Guidebook. It um, describes the approaches that these schools use in teaching, environment, safety, and administration. And you can download the introduction that has an overview of the practices and lots of background information. Um, and that's available for free on the Natural Start website. We recognize that uh, nature-based education has been practiced in North America by indigenous peoples since time immemorial. The first programs in the U.S. who called themselves nature-based preschools began to emerge in the late 1960s, starting with the new Canaan Nature Center in Connecticut. As they started to gradually spread, most programs were located at nature centers. And while there are still many nature preschools located at nature centers, Programs have expanded to occupy a wide variety of settings. There are public program options and programs with a range of focus areas. Nature preschools can be found anywhere that young children are learning, including home-based settings, farms, zoos and aquariums, and university lab schools, which play an important role in introducing pre-service early childhood educators to the nature-based approach. There are Head Start programs and preschools connected to public school districts that receive public funding. With so many programs, a wide range of focus areas have emerged from programs that center inclusion to language immersion and STEM-based preschools, all utilizing a nature-based approach. And while many people might imagine these preschools set in lush forest or on acres and acres of open land, which some programs certainly have access to, there are many nature-based programs in urban areas and city centers that make the most of what's available to them, including intentionally designed outdoor classrooms and quite frequently public lands, which we'll share more about later. So um, in 2017, we counted and surveyed nature preschools in the US for the first time. And we were going to survey them again in 2020, but the pandemic hit and it was not possible to do that. So uh, in 2020, we provided a snapshot report that just reported on the number of schools. And that was a count that we took before the pandemic hit. We were able to conduct the survey at the end of 2022. And this report that we released this week shares uh, the findings from that survey. It covers the number of programs, program operations, and characteristics of children and staff in nature preschools. And I think, um, and we can pause right here if you like and uh, see if there's any questions that have come in. Sure, I have a couple of questions that came in registration related to what you've talked about so far. And lots of folks are asking about if any of these nature schools focus on academic learning. So for example, are, are they incorporating play specifically through writing and reading and mathematics and whether any of these centers tie nature learning to state standards and if that helps justify its inclusion in the curriculum. Do either of you have any comments about that? Yeah, I'm happy to, to answer this one. Thanks, Anne. Uh, so we when we talk about play and learning in early childhood, we're actually talking about the same thing, which a, a lot of you I'm sure recognize because in early childhood play is how children learn. So while maybe 
to the layman's eye. Uh, it might look like a children who is playing at the mud kitchen, is simply enjoying themselves, mixing up a mystery potion. <laughs> There's actually so much going on there. You know, they're practicing math, problem solving, reasoning, language as they talk to their friends about what they're doing, and so much more. The point being that you can't really separate those two things in early childhood. You can't separate play and learning. Um, I think it's safe to say that that every nature preschool, just like more traditional preschools, um, are working on academics and preparing children for kindergarten. Research actually shows that children in nature preschools are on track with their peers in non-nature preschools and even excel in non-academic domains, areas like self-regulation, resiliency, curiosity, being able to listen and follow directions, um, which are all things that I'm sure every kindergarten teacher would tell you is a very good predictor of success in school um, compared to just knowing their letters and numbers. Um, and I'm sure any nature preschool teacher would also tell you that anything you can teach indoors, you can teach outdoors. And they would be more than happy to show you what that looks like. Um, and because this, this movement has grown so much, um, there are a lot of resources out there that can that guide educators in connecting the early learning standards to outdoor activities. One example is um, we did a webinar with Project Learning Tree a couple months ago about their guide Trees and Me, and they actually have connections to the standards and connections to um, the Nature based preschool professional practice guidebook. So that's a really great resource. So there's definitely a lot out there um, to make those connections. Um, but just when you're thinking about what children are learning through play, it's constant, you know, it's everything. They're doing everything that traditional preschool is doing, but just outdoors. Uh, and I would just add quickly to that, that um, a lot of nature-based programs will use sort of specialized tools for documentation and assessment. Um, <clears throat> so they're, they're um, assessing children's progress as they play. So they use specialized tools that help them track. They're looking for those specific markers of skills and knowledge that are developing, but they kind of observe that as children are playing rather than um, using maybe some more traditional kind of assessment tools. Keep going. Can we keep going with our slides? Yep, keep going. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, we're excited. We want to jump into what we found. Um, and first, uh, <clears throat> we should take a look at how many programs there are in the US today. Nature preschools have been growing very rapidly over the past 10 years, as many of you probably know. So we were very interested to know if that growth was continuing, especially given all the disruptions of the pandemic. So as you can see, the answer is yes, <laughs> they are continuing to grow very rapidly. We estimate that there are 800 nature preschools in the US today. So exciting. I wish we could just all just sit with that number for a minute because it's incredible. It's amazing to see it grow. And that graph is just one of our favorite things to look at. So. Um, people are often surprised to learn that nature preschools can be found in nearly every state in the U.S., not just in areas with mild climates. Washington, California, and Minnesota all have more than 50 nature preschools each, ranking them as the states with the highest number of nature preschools. When you rank um, the number of nature school preschools per capita, schools are most concentrated in the Northeast, with Vermont and Maine and New Hampshire topping the list. You'll look at these states and you'll notice that, you know, except for California, none of these states are particularly known for having ideal weather. Um, it, while it may surprise people, there is a historical context for outdoor learning in cold climates. In terms of a formalized approach to, um, to nature-based early learning, nature preschools originated in Scandinavia, where winter temps are frequently below freezing. Planning, preparation, parent communication, and high quality gear are all essential to operating outdoors year round. In Minnesota, a state with notably harsh winters, there are more than 50 nature preschools with a group concentrated in Duluth, including Wind Ridge Schoolhouse. Uh, cold climates, like in Duluth, <laughs> offer unique play and learning opportunities from sledding to ice fishing, 
Um, to keep students warm and comfortable, teachers in these programs will offer warm drinks like tea throughout the day, time to relax by the fire, shelter from the wind, and in the case of this program, students occasionally enjoy time in a sauna. On the flip side, programs that are located in warmer climates, such as Will Smith Zoo School in San Antonio, Texas, have different considerations. When it's especially hot outside, educators offer more opportunities for water play, take rest in the shade, ensure that children are drinking plenty of water, and potentially move indoors during the hottest parts of the day where they can continue to engage in nature play. In all nature preschools, safety is of the utmost importance, and educators are trained to recognize signs of overexposure and overheating, depending on the weather. Is it more work to build a fire, to clean and dry children's gear, to lug extra drinks around outdoors? Yes, of course. But because of the benefits to children's development, these programs are making time in nature a priority. I love those examples so much. Um, okay, so let's shift and start to look at some of the features that we uh, saw about nature preschools. So not so surprisingly, probably, schools that put nature at the heart of the curriculum are spending a lot of time outside in nature. We found that nature preschools are spending even more time outside than they have in the past. 70% of programs spend 70% or more of the school day outside. The average percent of the school day that's spent outdoors increased from 75% of the day in 2017 to 80% in 2022, and nearly a third of programs spend the entire school day outside. And that figure is also up from 2017. But um, for anyone who's not a preschool educator, it is important to remember that um, the preschool school day is not like a school day or a work day for an adult. And we only asked programs to tell us about their regular school day hours. We excluded any before or after care options that they might offer. So on average, full day programs told us they spend five hours per day outside and half day programs are spending three hours outside each day. The COVID pandemic could be a factor in moving more programs outside for the entire school day. Additionally, a large majority of preschools indicated that the pandemic increased demand for outdoor programs. But of course, the pandemic also brought serious challenges. Many programs shared that they noticed a negative impact on children's mental health, as well as financial and staffing challenges. It's worth noting that these issues are persistent and programs are still dealing with them. While there are schools that increase their time outdoors, there were also programs like Durham Community Preschool in North Carolina that adopted the nature-based approach for the first time during the pandemic. Roseville Pony, the executive director of Durham Community Preschool, shared a bit about her program's transition outdoors. She said, we're learning how strong and resilient we are to be outside in all kinds of weather. At first we thought 40 degree weather was cold. Now our record low for operating outside is 24 degrees. We are learning how to adjust our activity planning and allow for nature to share its bounty with us. The children are so strong from playing outside. It's incredible. Their laughter, curiosity, and excitement has blessed us every day. As teachers, we have grown stronger too we are learning a different way of teaching. It's just such a beautiful example. We um, have loved working with Rose a little bit over the years. For programs like Dur Durham, Durham Community Preschool, having a network of professionals experience in nature-based early learning to connect with was pivotal, representing the essential need for professional networks and resources, especially for programs looking to increase their natureness and for establishing new programs. While Durham had a partnership with a church that allowed them access to outdoor spaces, finding land to operate on can be a limiting factor for programs. Securing private land for nature preschool is expensive and often to the point of being cost prohibitive. So many programs opt to utilize public lands when possible. In fact, more than half of nature preschools operate on or visit public lands. I think that's so cool. 
Just as there is a wide variety of program types, how programs use public lands also varies. Uh, Appalachian Forest School, based in Virginia, is a roving preschool program. So at the beginning of the day, parents drop children off with teachers, they all load up into a passenger van, and then they take off and spend the day exploring the Shenandoah Valley, including national, city, and state forests and parks. Then on the other side of the country, Northeast LA Forest School operates primarily in city parks. While Appalachian Forest School changes locations all the time, Northeast LA Forest School sets up a base camp that students can return to day after day. And these are just two examples. You know, we, we received a lot of questions um, about the use of public lands, and we see it as a very frequent discussion topic among our community. Um, we only have time to touch on this today. So while these two programs use public lands nearly every day, I wanted to share that there are also other nature preschools that might explore a city park once a week and use private land the majority of the time. And I want to point out that there are, of course, different safety considerations for programs that use public lands, as well as a unique approach to how the children interact with their outdoor classroom. Most programs adopt a leave no trace, um, but must find a balance between care for the land and also what's developmentally appropriate for young children. So that's a really common discussion. It's common for programs also to have an agreement with the Parks Department if they're regularly using a public space. But these agreements vary widely from place to place and program to program. There's not really a standard, but um, we got a question about that. So I wanted to share that that is, is fairly common. Um, okay, so <clears throat> we also asked programs if they are licensed. And um, licensing is a complex issue in outdoor nature-based education, but to try to put it as briefly as possible, um, programs that operate entirely or even mostly outdoors can't always be licensed. Um, our licensing systems were really built around the idea that education happens indoors and the outdoors is for breaks. So to be licensed programs usually have to have fully outfitted indoor spaces, even if they rarely use those spaces. And also um, licensing requirements might not allow for some really standard elements of nature-based learning, like having animals that might visit your play area or climbing trees or in cold programs, maybe using a fire to keep warm. So <clears throat> in most states, you can operate a program without being licensed if you operate for fewer hours or with fewer children than's required for licensing. And so that's what many programs do. But there are a couple of problems with that. And the biggest is that if a program isn't licensed, it can't receive any public funding for children. And that limits who can choose the program. And it also kind of by definition, because they have to operate for shorter hours, limits the length of the school day. And that further limits who can choose the program. Uh, in our survey, we found that 58% of nature preschools are licensed, but among programs that spend all of their school time outside, just 15% are licensed, and licensing rates haven't changed substantially since 2017. But we are hopeful that we might see some improvements here in the coming years. Uh, Washington State created a permanent licensing option for outdoor preschools in 2021. Maryland just passed legislation this spring. Colorado is working on new outdoor uh, preschool licensing option and legislation is pending in Oregon. So there are also many other people working in other states or in various stages of advocating for outdoor preschool licensing. And um, all of that work at Natural Start is coordinated by Kit Harrington, who's our policy advisor and wonderful person who tries to keep her hands on all of these different developments and keep everyone connected. So we're really hopeful about the future, but it is clearly something that's gonna take some time. And I'm just going to take a minute, I'm gonna share a short clip of a video from the Washington State Department of Children, Youth and Families um, about their new, newish last year's uh, um, new licensing option. In 2021, Washington State Legislature passed Senate Bill SB 5151 that authorizes the Washington State Department of Children, Youth and Families, DCYF, to license outdoor nature-based childcare programs that enroll preschool or school-age children, 
teach a nature-based curriculum and provide daily nature-based learning experiences, DCYF's commitment to a high-quality integrated system for children of all ages, while eliminating racial disproportionality, is in complete alignment with outdoor nature-based providers. The new legislation provided DCYF the opportunity to partner with tribes, providers, and stakeholders to develop and implement specific rules promoting a safe and healthy environment in a nature-based setting. We became a licensed uh, outdoor nature-based program uh, for a number of reasons. So Fiddleheads has had already been around for five or six years um, and one of the co-founders was actually active in getting the state of Washington to license nature-based preschools and we were part of the pilot program to make sure that our philosophies could reach as broad an audience as possible and in addition we're able to take children who need to pay with state subsidies um, so those two are huge equity components um, and then of course we just have access to a number of um, trainings and other resources through GCYF, which has been huge for us. They did such a nice job with that video. And um, just want to point out that <clears throat> Maddie Cole, who is the director of Fiddlehead Forest School in the video called out um, their former director who was um, really involved in getting those standards passed in Washington. And that is Kit Harrington, who is our policy advisor. She has just really wonderful experience in this area and we're so happy to get to work with her. Um, so, um, and before we switch back to our slides, maybe this is another good point to um, take some questions. Yes, yes, thank you. So many questions about licensing. How do folks get started? How do they get started in their states? Do you offer a toolkit or consulting for states that are interested in getting started with licensing their own forest schools? What kind of advice would you give folks who are looking to get started? Um, <clears throat> I think that your very best bet is to start with Kit Carrington, who I just mentioned. Um, an email to naturalstartinfo at naturalstart.org is where you could start and we can connect you with her. She has been doing a really terrific job, I think, of trying to, like I said, keep up with what's happening in all the different states get to know who's working on these issues in all the states. And um, we have a sort of a national network of folks who are working on this and we meet regularly. Those folks are sharing their resources all the time, um, what they're learning, what isn't working, what is working. It's a long-term process to get this licensing passed. As you can see, this year is in the making <laughs> and we just have these few states that are really jumping in now. So um, <clears throat> I would start there. And then we're going to be reworking our uh, website at National Start. Finally, 10 years in, we're going to do it. And you can see that that kind of advocacy is really well represented on our site because when we first started, that wasn't really on the radar. This is something that has developed over the years. So we'll be reworking that to provide more resources there also. But for right now, I think joining that kind of national network of folks is probably the best place to start. Wonderful. And if you haven't checked out the chat, there's lots of people that are volunteering their advice and services in the chat. So check it out. Lots of experts that are here in the room with us today. Oh, and then one you. more question. Um, another a person is asking about how do they do their own market research to see whether or not their program might be viable. And if you related to that, if you have any tips for partnering with parks. Emily, do you have thoughts? Yeah, so um, really I would point to a, a few specific resources that we have available on the Natural Start website, which I can, um, I'll happily grab a, a few links that I can drop in the chat. But um, I would say that um, one, you, you wanna look at what's available already in your area. Are there organizations that are already offering this sort of thing? Are you filling a need within your community? Um, definitely recommend doing your research. And um, we have a really wonderful um, resource on the Natural Start website that was written by um, Rachel Laramore um, and David Catlin, actually, who talk about business planning for nature preschools. And they have also several years running done a um, session for the Natural Start conference about the same topic, because as you can imagine, as there are so many, there's so much growth in programs, that means there's new programs all the time. So there um, are a lot of resources actually out there. And um, further than that, they do some excellent consulting that um, might help you as you're figuring these things out. Because 
it is connecting with um, a public park is one model um, and they have quite a bit of experience with that. So um, I would, in a moment, I can drop in um, a couple of resources and we can make sure that those are shared afterwards as well. But there's a lot to dig into when you're thinking about starting. And I would just like to call out that Aliza, I saw Aliza in the chat. Aliza, yeah, you're from, she's from the Washington Department of Children, Youth and Families and uh, was absolutely instrumental in developing that licensing option. And um, thank you for being here, Aliza. And she has so graciously offered to um, answer any questions. Um, and she said that they have a really great template of their agreements for working with parks. So um, they have been absolutely amazing in doing their own work to start this licensing option, but also in really being so supportive to um, agencies in other states who um, are trying to figure out how they can do this too. Should we move on to the next section? Let's do it. I think we'll have more time for questions at the end. Okay, so um, now we will uh, dive into the children's characteristics or our characteristics of children in nature preschool. So we asked a series of questions to better understand um, who is attending nature preschool. Overall, the number of children enrolled in nature preschool has grown quite a bit um, from 10,000 in 2017 to 25,000 in 2022. So well more than doubled um, in the last five years, which is expected with the growing number of programs. We also asked uh, programs about children who are multiple language learners. And responses show that the average percentage of multiple language learners in nature preschools in 2022 is up significantly from 2017, but is below the national average of preschool aged children who are multilingual. Anecdotally, we've noticed the emergence of dual language and language immersion programs that are also nature based. Not surprisingly, Spanish language programs are the most common type of dual language or language immersion preschools we see in this space with options expanding. To name just a few, Chavito's Nature School in Washington, Amigos del Bosque in Minnesota, and Aventura's Forest School in California all offer Spanish language immersion. My World Mandarin Nature School and Rainbow Mandarin Nature School, both in Washington, offer Mandarin immersion. And, and you might notice um, that these programs are often located in areas with a high number of nature preschools, Washington, Minnesota, California. These are not all the examples. Um, but when there are more options for families, programs are able to um, focus on specific things or sort of differentiate themselves from other programs. Notably, um, we've also seen an increase in programs offering American Sign Language instruction, which allows children who are deaf or hard of hearing to participate in nature preschool. There's been a concerted effort to make nature preschools more accessible to all children as the number of nature preschools has increased. Since 2017, the average percent of children with disabilities in nature-based programs has increased from 4.7% to 8.3%. Nature preschools currently serve children with disabilities at similar rates as public schools in the US. Developmental delay, speech or language impairment, and autism are the most common disabilities represented in nature preschools, mirroring the most common disabilities represented in public schools. A greater number of resources, more experienced educators, connections with occupational therapists, and an overall desire to meet the needs of more children are all drivers behind the effort to make nature preschools more inclusive. And, and though this, presentation focuses mostly on what information we collected in the report, I wanted to add that we've heard quite frequently from the parents of young children who might struggle in more traditional early learning environments, that outdoor environments not only allow them to get by, but also thrive. At Secret Forest Play School, for example, 25% of the children that attend are deaf or hard of hearing. The lead teacher is a certified interpreter and communicates in both American Sign Language, ASL, and spoken English throughout the day. The preschool offered a five-week class that families and young children attended to learn basic ASL and deaf culture from a deaf mentor. 
This story, which I really love from uh, Secret Forest Preschool, serves as a dual example of how nature preschools can be both inclusive and rooted in the community that they are located in. And this is just one example. There are also programs such as Amua Inclusion Preschool in Hawaii and Seattle Children's Play Garden, where serving children with disabilities in nature is central to the program's mission. Efforts to make nature preschools more inclusive to children with disabilities for example, providing a quiet space where children, if they're overstimulated, can rest, or providing transition supports throughout the school day, often have the benefit of improving the learning environment for all children. Okay, so we also have been tracking the racial and ethnic makeup of children in programs. We saw in 2017 that children who are Black and Latino are underrepresented in programs, and children who are white are overrepresented. And unfortunately, that pattern hasn't changed a lot since then. In 2022, we added a multiracial option to the survey, which wasn't there in 2017. So <clears throat> that did cause some shifts in the pattern of the answers. But as you can see, if you look at uh, the numbers for children who are not white, there are not big changes in their levels of representation. So we think the bottom line here is that we haven't made substantial progress. And I just wanna point out that this survey really only focused on numbers. It was about the how many, and really, we couldn't dive into the why in this context. And I think we really need to de excuse me, to dive deeper into this to understand what's behind these differences in participation. We think that cost is probably one factor. Research shows that Black and Latino children enroll in public preschool programs at higher rates than white children. And only 25% of nature preschools operate with public funding today. So that's certainly a piece of the picture. But we know that that is not the only factor, and we really, really need to know more. We're wondering about things like where programs are located, whether the program uh, length is an issue. So many nature preschools operate with only a half day option. Um, what are people's educational preferences? The idea of learning outdoors most of the day is just not appealing to everyone. That's fine, but we need to understand. Um, are low, lower levels of representation of programs a factor? If families don't see children and teachers in programs that they can relate to, is that sending a message that a program isn't for them? Um, there are certainly other factors that we're not even thinking about. We really need more information about this to help us do more to diversify programs. But for now, our focus is on licensing to bring public funding to outdoor learning as a first step. Finally, we, we asked programs or we asked questions about staff and programs to better understand the nature preschool workforce. As programs have grown, obviously the workforce has grown too, um, from 1,500 professionals in 2017 to around 6,000 in 2022. As stated, this growth is largely driven by the growing number of programs as nature preschools have on average the same number of staff per program as they did five years ago. The racial diversity of staff in nature preschools broadly matches the diversity of children in these programs, with white educators being overrepresented relative to the early childhood workforce and Latino and Black educators being underrepresented relative to the overall workforce. As you can see, the discrepancies are pretty significant. As with the diversity of children in these programs, we need more research to understand why and to identify what supports will bring more diversity to the workforce. In Baltimore, a nonprofit organization, Backyard Base Camp, is reconnecting Black, Indigenous, and people of color to land and nature and represents one approach to increasing diversity in the workforce. Their home base, Bliss Meadows, is located in a predominantly Black neighborhood, and the organization prioritizes hiring from within the community. They also are piloting a workforce development program that trains young adults to work in environmental and outdoor education. And we encourage you to, to check them out and learn more about them directly. Another type of diversity we track is gender diversity in the workforce. 
men and gender non-conforming professionals are better represented in nature preschools than in preschools overall, making up nearly 10% of the nature preschool workforce compared to just 2.5% of the overall preschool workforce. Just as there is an inherent value in diverse racial representation and staff, it's important for children to see gender diversity. Children have a right to see themselves reflected in their teachers. And lastly, we took a look at staff compensation. A reminder that preschool educators are among the lowest paid professionals in the US. While nature preschool educators make 24% more on average than other, other preschool educators, they still make 45% less than the average US worker. There's a notable jump in wage from preschool to kindergarten educators, though kindergarten educators are still among the lowest paid public school teachers. That graph makes me feel so mad. <laughs> Um, okay, well, putting that bad news behind us, let's um, look to the future. Um, so as we think about future growth of nature preschools in the U.S., we do predict that this growth pattern will continue. 70% of programs report that they are maintaining wait lists, so there's still strong demand for programs. But if you remember back to that chart that we shared of growth uh, earlier, Programs are growing rapidly, and um, as Emily mentioned earlier, that means that many programs are new, sort of by definition. And nature-based learning is a new approach to early childhood education, so we need a lot of new supports for this sector, and we need to be thoughtful about how we can design those supports in ways that will address equity and diversity in programs, not just among children, but also among educators. So first, uh, we need more professionals to training to support this expansion. Nature-based education is different. There are unique approaches and a lot of considerations around safety in particular. Um, opportunities for training uh, have grown with the field, but we need more. And we really need to be thoughtful about how those professional development programs can help bring more diversity to the workforce. Next, uh, we need specialized professional networks to support nature-based educators. Our early childhood education system in the US is really operates at the state level. Every state has different requirements, public funding for preschools flows through states, preschool educators need state level networks, and there's a growing network of state-based organizations for nature preschool educators. We've highlighted the states here, the list of the organizations is in the report. I see some of um, representatives from these programs, uh, these organizations here, and thank you for your incredible work. Um, but as you can see in this um, map, not every state has one of these networks, and most of these organizations are entirely volunteer run, and as a result, they have limited capacity. We really need more state-level support for nature-based education professionals. And lastly, as we've talked about, licensing for outdoor preschools is a really high priority. Not only can public funding help make outdoor preschools more accessible to every family, but licensing these programs can also add capacity to the early care and education system. The pandemic really hurt early childhood programs and states are now trying to move to expand access, but we need more capacity. Bringing these outdoor preschools online will really help in that effort. And over the long term, we really believe that licensing outdoor preschools can elevate the importance of outdoor environments in early care and education settings. It can really help our regulators see what's possible when children learn outside, and they can also be assured that it can be done safely. And ultimately, it's this diffusion of nature across the early childhood landscape that's really the goal. Every school does not need to be a nature preschool, but Every child deserves high quality education and lots of opportunities to play and learn in nature. Nature preschools, we believe, are really leading the way in helping us think about how we can shift our systems to bring more nature into early childhood education. That, we believe, should be a right for every single child. 
So thank you so much to all of you for being here. You've been asking such great questions and being so generous with your knowledge in the chat. We appreciate that so much. And I also want to say a really big thank you to our funder, the Store Foundation. They were absolutely visionary in supporting the nature preschool movement right from the very start. And absolutely our work would not be possible without their support. So thank you to Store Foundation. Thank you to our wonderful staff and thank you all so much for being here. We're happy to take more questions. Thank you, Christy and Emily, excellent job. And thanks to Betty and Kit who aren't on um, the um, panelists line, but all the work that the whole team has done. This report really gives us an important snapshot of what's happening and what we all need to do. And there were a lot of questions in the chat, um, Emily and Christy, so we might not get to all of them. If you wanna talk anything, any more about any studies you've seen about military families, anything more on accreditation efforts, um, lots of questions on licensing of court that you've already, licensing that you've already answered, and anything else, Emily, that you caught or Christy that I, that I missed or Ann. But if you want to just respond to a couple of those and then we can wrap up. But thank you so much. Great job. Christy, I did catch one, um, uh, something that's included in the report that we didn't um, include in this presentation that was asked about was uh, qualifications or education level of, um, at, of educators in nature preschools. And I wondered if you either recalled off the top of your head or could point to um, that information. Oh, 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 I see education level. Uh, yes. Uh, I should pull it up so I have the exact figures. But basically, in a nutshell, we did find that um, nature based educators are much more likely to have a college degree than uh, preschool educators on average. Um, I could tell you more about how we asked that question and it would probably get into a lot of details, but uh, the short answer is a very highly educated workforce. And um, I, there was a question um, from the registration and actually a few questions that really kind of hit around this particular area. Um, I'm sh I hope everyone after hearing this presentation feels that um, they feel fired up to work to get more nature into early childhood settings. And there are always, always questions about how can we present the value of this approach to early learning? Um, and Christy and I talked a little bit about this and um, it totally, it, it definitely varies uh, who you are, like what your role is, whether you're a parent or an educator or just or average concerned citizen, um, and also where you are and who you're sort of trying to make the case to. And we have um, some really wonderful resources. And I just wanted to share, because along with this, this growth of nature preschools, um, you'll see a mirroring of a growth in the number of resources and the research that is available to people. Um, so I just wanted to point that, you know, compared to those early days of nature preschools, there is now, there are a lot of successful examples um, that can help you make the case. And um, whether that's research or examples of existing programs, um, some people need to see what it looks like in action. And so a really wonderful resource that we have on our website um, is we have a map of nature preschools. I feel like I, I saw in the chat a couple of questions around um, just, just knowing like a program to connect with, for example, because that's a really wonderful place to start. Um, and so we have a nature preschool map that I can drop in the chat here as well. Oh, thank you, Betty. Um, so I, I would look there. Um, and just really think about who your audience is. Who are you talking to? Um, who are you making the case to? Is research going to be the thing? Is it our example is going to be the thing? Is seeing it in action going to be the thing that turns them? Um, and the bottom line really is just nature is good for everyone. It's not, there's research, a lot of research about that too. It's not just good for young children. It's wonderful for young children, but it's good for everyone. So Emily and Christy, any final words? Um, uh, Rebecca put in the chat. So now that we have this report, what's next? So any final words before we turn it over to Anne? Thank you again. 
Um, well, to, to your point, Judy, I just, what you said just reminded me that um, yesterday when we shared the report to our mailing list, um, we got a really nice reply back from someone a few hours later, and she said, I really love this report. She said, it really shows how far we've come, but also how far we have to go. And I thought, if that didn't just really capture everything, um, I really appreciated that comment, and I think it really captures what we've done here. I, I completely agree, and, and that also makes me think of um, something we've been talking about, which is we've come so far um, that when we're talking about this policy change and licensing, um, it's important to remember that change takes time. It takes a lot of time. Um, so you have to be willing to keep plugging away at it um, if you want to see change and remember that even a small change is still a change. Thank you both so much for all you do. And Anne, do you want to close us out? And thanks to all of you for the great comments in the chat. Thank you, thank you. And we are at a tipping point. Oh, so much love in the chat and invitations to connect and share expertise and resources. And it just really shows what a strong interest there is around early childhood education. So thank you, Emily and Christy, for spending the hour with us. And thanks to all of you for spending the hour with us. We will be sharing the webinar recording and the notes and all of the wonderful resources that we shared in the chat. We'll be posting that up on our website on EE Pro by the end of the week. And if um, you really wanna be the first to hear about anything going on, webinar wise or otherwise, I invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel at the NAAAE, and you'll be the first to get all of our recordings sent straight to your emails, and you can get updates anytime that we have information to share from webinars. And I want to highlight one resource that Emily mentioned earlier in the hour, and this is from one of our fabulous partners, Project Learning Tree. And this is just a wonderful tool that they created with Natural Start's professional practice guidebook, completely in alignment with this guidebook. And it includes so many different lesson plans, examples, experiences. And Jackie was busy in the chat from PLT sharing the direct link. So I just wanted to give one more shout out about this wonderful resource from Project Learning Tree. And if you want to hear about more resources, and if you want to connect to other professionals doing this really incredible work, you can now register for the Nature-Based Early Learning Conference. It's going to be online this year. It's happening at the end of July. And with registration, you'll get access to all of the recordings for an entire year. So go ahead and register for that today. And you'll see that um, the conference is really going to be highlighting how early childhood education programs can really affect the health of students and teachers and parents and communities. So there's gonna be a really cool health component. So check it out. Um, one more conference update, the NAAAE conference. Our conference will also be online this year. It's gonna be happening later in the year in October. And just want to let you know to stay tuned because registration is going to be opening very soon in the month of June. So stay tuned for more information coming very soon. And that's it. Thanks, everybody, for spending the hour with us. Thank you again, Christy and Emily, for sharing this wonderful um, information from the latest survey. And we hope to see all of you on another webinar very soon. Take care, everybody, and we'll see you later. Bye, y'all. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Thanks again, y'all. Thanks, Anne. We can go back into our group again. Oh, no, we can't. Okay. No. <laughs> Thank you. We, we have Bye, everybody. 52 else. people online. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Nice job. <laughs>